So I have uh, two back-to-back -back, uh, presentations, uh, which uh, first one I'm gonna go over is uh, advanced packaging for 5G and RF and analog mixed signals. Um, and uh, so, so this is one of the chapters of the uh, HRR, uh, which really, you know, it's one of the vertical applications uh, that we're gonna use all the capabilities and materials and uh, processes that uh, this whole uh, ecosystem will develop. Uh, uh, for, for, for example, for RF. So uh, in RF, as you know, uh, we go through a, a new generation of uh, smartphones, uh, of, of, of mobile phones every decade. So right now we are beginning the era of uh, 5G uh, starting in the 2020 uh, and probably lasting a decade. And then beyond that will be 6G. So the major applications I won't really get too much into, hopefully you have been following 5G uh, is for the three major areas of uh, embedded uh, mobile broadband and the ultra reliability, low latency comm and massive machine to machine communication. So almost everything will fall into one of those three buckets and all three of them have different uh, performance metrics and so forth. But, uh, and, and then, then I will describe to you, uh, I think uh, what the status is at, at, on the base station side as well as on the handset and then, uh, and then uh, show you some of the challenges that I think we need to solve together. So that's, that's where we are today. So if you can remember nothing else about 5G, uh, right now it's somewhere between a reality and a hype. So everything is uh, at least 10 x better than 4G or, or, or better. And so uh, as you who have already purchased 5G handsets, we'll probably figure out we're not anywhere close to any of these numbers. In fact, it's been quite, quite disappointing. Um, there are three bands. Uh, the uh, low band is a uh, lower gigahertz. Uh, mid band is between one and six gigahertz. And then high band, uh, people commonly call high band or millimeter wave between 40 to 100 gigahertz with two of the current bands deployed are 20, uh, uh, 28 gigahertz and 39 gigahertz. And each with uh, much higher instantaneous bandwidths. So, so as I already mentioned, um, I will focus on the R front end primarily at the UE uh, and at the base station. And so we want to help guide uh, the development of this technology, especially for millimeter wave. I'm not really gonna cover uh, the mid band below because I think that is more evolutionary and uh, it's, uh, it's being addressed by, by primarily uh, uh, various different uh, people who've been looking, making 4G handsets and so forth and, and, and doing that. So, but the big, challenge, the big challenge is in 5G, in millimeter wave. So we want to look, look across the uh, three, five and 10 year horizons. And I want to address particular semiconductor advanced packaging trades. So the vision is that uh, we have affordable millimeter wave solutions to meet small cell deployments in urban and, and, and rural areas. So if they're starting out right now only in urban, uh, be probably a fair amount of time before we get to rural. But energy efficiency is a big deal. Um, uh, we're all aware of that uh, energy is a uh, key resource that we cannot waste. And the other big uh, resource that is also very um, tight is uh, a spectrum. So there's many approaches to look at how we can uh, squeeze as much throughput in a particular uh, megahertz bandwidth and then dynamically share among all the different users uh, who, who would uh, uh, want to make, make uh, use of it, okay? Um, so, so right now, of course, we need to develop scalable customized solutions that meet or exceed uh, 3GPP specifications. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit toward the end about what it means to transition from 5G to 6G. So what are the, the this technology needs for 5G? At the top level, we're looking for extremely high bandwidth, low latency wireless communication. We're looking at to, uh, doing edge processing of sensor data using machine learning uh, and, and AI. Uh, and overcoming the slowdown of Moore's law for scaling. Uh, uh, and that, that uh, the slowdown is, is uh, felt at both the base station and, and at the handset. So what is impossibly enabled by heterogeneous integration? Well, uh, uh, I'll talk about this uh, soon. A phase array architecture is gonna require uh, smaller and smaller but dense uh, uh, microelectronics. Uh, and uh, and that, that's one big thing that H, uh, heterogeneous integration can help. And then integration of low, low power processors and FPGAs to support uh, digital signal processing and beamforming. 
Third is allows us uh, to have process diversity through integration of silicon and 3.5 devices using advanced materials and substrates. So technology-wise, uh, I already mentioned there's a tight uh, integration needed because the lambda over two spacing for phase array elements, if you look at 30 gigahertz, it's only uh, five millimeter. So at that spacing, uh, we really no longer can afford to have discrete components. We need to have integrated the ICs and then very advanced packaging to put everything in a very tight space. So, so that is really one of the three challenges uh, for millimeter wave design. Of course, there's semiconductor IC design uh, modeling challenges. Then there's this packaging, which I really uh, I'll talk about in this talk. And then measurement is also very difficult because millimeter wave is challenging and we're trying to do over the air calibration and measurements of phase arrays that have not been tested at the component level. So what are the key antenna packages requirements? So you can see that we are trying to uh, create a, uh, a radiator where each element that their signal from uh, are combined coherently so that we can create a narrow beam and focus that beam on, on the targeted uh, uh, handset. In and two minutes left. Want, uh, and we want to have really good performance in, in that area. So, so right now, this is uh, uh, kind of the idea that what, what right now that are being looked at today and needs to be developed. The, the left and center are in development and the glass wafers and other structures are still in research mode, okay? So in terms of semiconductors, there are many trades between gas and GAN and silicon uh, for each base or for each usage and also trying to uh, take the trade between what you want radiated power and the number of elements is all part of the equation. Uh, so uh, you can see here a picture of a millimeter wave, uh, uh, a small cell, okay? So, so this is starting to be in the deployment. So what, what we're gonna do at the base station is to use a still more or less board level technology and in the form that I showed you earlier uh, and to create a, a, a phase array that I can show here on the right hand side that can perform the function, okay? A handset is a different situation, right? You don't have that much space and, and you also have potential blockage by the, the, the human uh, holding it. So there are gonna be much smaller antennas, uh, usually gonna be placed at the corner uh, edges of, of, the, of the handset. So big challenge right now, as I mentioned, is integration of our front end and the digital back end processing. And particularly I wanna point out that the millimeter wave filters are gonna be a big, big challenge. So here's an example of, uh, of one of the handset uh, 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 antenna elements uh, first used in, for example, the Samsung um, phone last year. But the, right now, the, this is still very expensive compared to 4G radios, and we have a long way to go. Um, yep, Tim, you should consider another, wrapping up just because we are running okay, short of time. Another area that I won't be able to dive into is additive manufacturing uh, in order to, to print uh, uh, the circuit structures and then to use them and deploy them in 5G. In 6G, uh, as I mentioned, it's, the, it's a decade following this one, and it's gonna uh, basically operate between say 120, 140 gigahertz to 1000 gigahertz. And then there are many major challenges, including atmospheric attenuation and even smaller uh, element to element spacing, which is now down to one millimeter at 150 gigahertz. So these are uh, some of the uh, benefits that I won't go into because I won't have much time, uh, uh, but you can look at these slides when you better get them. So, um, so right now we are in the midst of beginning the 20, uh, 20s of 5G era, and uh, we uh, uh, continue to look at what's gonna happen in 6G. Uh, so which will be uh, the additional material that will be added for uh, the next edition of this chapter. Thank you. Tim, thank you, I appreciate it. I know this is a lot of content and I apologize for rushing you through this. Uh, why don't we move forward and uh, get Benson Benson, you're up next. All right, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the, the mobile chapter. Uh, this is another one of the twigs that's uh, in the roadmap. Uh, the team, team consists of uh, myself, Bill Chen, uh, Brandon Pryor, and uh, Mark Gerber. Um, we are a very small group. And so if anyone would like to have, or at least uh, participate in this uh, twig, uh, please let me or, or Bill know. Uh, the agenda today is going to be pretty quick. Uh, basically, talk about you know uh, mobile being an essential tool for for our daily lives. I mean, we really can't live without you know the phone that's stuck to you. Uh, a little about capabilities, growth, uh, the, the 
what Tim just spoke about, which is the 5G millimeter wave uh, technology disruption, uh, what it means uh, to the package itself, um, how much space it's gonna take, uh, touch a little about the battery. Uh, basically anything that we add to the phone that needs to be uh, powered. So again, it's gonna put more emphasis on how big of a battery we can put in. Uh, understand that the phone is a finite space and you've got to put more and more stuff into it because every year you have more and more uh, things that people want to put in. Uh, collaborations with the technical uh, other twigs and then a quick summary. So the global market for mobile is still growing. Uh, even though we had uh, a, a bit of a, a drop due to COVID, um, we did experience a, uh, back in 2019, but probably a 19% drop in the market. But if you look at uh, 2020, it rebounded quite nicely. And if you look at this chart, it still shows that mobile is a, contrib a significant contributor to uh, the world uh, market, employment, uh, usage, uh, GDP, et cetera. So it is important. And so uh, what it says is by 2025, you know, 70% of the world population is going to have a subscription, uh, a mobile subscription, mobile phone, et cetera. And so what we're doing now is going to uh, help uh, that, that progress. Um, here's a chart that just shows mobile subscription by technology, meaning um, the growth between, uh, you know, the, the 2G, 3G, 4G, and then now 5G. And you look at it, uh, it you know, 2020, 2019 really was a start of the 5G uh, evolution. And, you know, even though uh, COVID-19 had a big impact, uh, on the market, you know, the, 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 uh, the adoptions. Um, 2020 actually came in pretty nicely. Uh, there's a, there was a, a, a good uptake on the iPhone 12 that came off with Apple. A lot of people buying it, as well as the Samsung, as well as the, the other phones, uh, a lot of the Asian um, uh, makers are really putting the emphasis on putting 5G as, as one of the big uh, features. And that's what's really driving a lot of the growth. Here's a, a um, the cartoon that came out uh, with uh, Gordon Moore's article. And if you look at it, you know, the, the thing in the middle is this handy home computer. Really what that, you know, in, 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 our, in our case, um, the, 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 the mobile product, the products, you know, the cell phones, the laptops, everything else, that's what could be in there. I mean, that's really what's, what's, uh, what, we, what we're seeing. Um, basically what you're doing is the, um, is pushing a lot of uh, technology into the into the package, just to allow you to have those features. Like for instance, you know, five nanometer, no processors, stack memories, and pops. You know, as seen in the Samsung processor as well as the, the Apple processor. Uh, facial recognition, time of flights, um, health and wearable. Definitely, uh, we're seeing a lot of integration of those uh, uh, different monitoring systems uh, into the phones. Uh, we see a big push on COVID uh, tracking, you know, smartphones, smartwatches, uh, everything else that goes into the mobile space. And we're gonna see more and more in the future. Um, here's a, a nice chart that shows the, the mobile uh, phone shipment by communication standards. So you look at the 2019, you know, you just saw a small uh, blip for uh, 5G, you know, sub six gigahertz. And, and that, that's, that technology is not hard to, to, to integrate. But what is hard is putting the 5G millimeter wave support into it. So for 2020, you had a really, uh, you had a, a, a good adoption. You, if you total those numbers up, you know, you're about 200, 240, you know, million units, uh, 2021, you expected to go to 400 million. So, you know, the, the adoption rate is gonna be much faster than the previous standards that we've seen today, you know, just by looking at uh, 3G to 4G, it took quite a while to, to get up there. And then you look at the, the forecasts uh, by 2024, you're looking at at least 55% of the phones, you know, being sold in the market would be uh, supporting 5G. So here's a, a chart that sort of goes along with Tim's, what Tim said. Uh, in order to integrate 5G into, the, into a phone, this, um, let me try to put this in. This, this section right here, this five millimeter wave, uh, baseband processor. This is, you know, this is sort of what you can do. If, you know, by uh, the early adoption of the 5G, was you can integrate 5G support for the lower bands, uh, not the, the section up here. 
into the, the 2G, 3G, 4G uh, processors and, and transceivers. And so it's not really difficult to do, but you just you don't get the performance uh, that you expect on 5G until you guys started adding in the specific millimeter wave uh, uh, components, you know, such as the broad, you know, baseband's and especially the, the transceivers and the, and the antennas. And that's what it's, it's, it's going to drive a lot of the, the, the new packaging that's going to be needed to support uh, that, that standard. And some couple of minutes left. Okay. So the iPhone 12, if you look at this chart, uh, it shows, you know, how typical it was to, to, to put all the stuff in. Um, this is the, 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 on the left side is the, uh, the, the main processing unit. It's actually two separate boards that's tied in with a, a series of interconnect bumps. And so that's, that's the way that you can uh, pack a lot of stuff into a very small space. And so what's different about it is look at all the pieces that are used to just support all the different standards. All right. So for Apple, what they did was uh, in this phone, you can actually support more than 100 different, uh, 150 different standards uh, so you can use it for around the world. Um, so for the Samsung S10 uh, uh, and as well as the, the Apple, there was a lot of work on integrating uh, the 5G millimeter wave antennas. Um, so you can, you can look at this uh, later on. Here's a good chart that just shows evolution. You know, what's happening to the phone? If you look from 20, 20, uh, 2007 when the first iPhone came out and you get all the different features that's been slowly being added uh, to the phone until the, uh, until the 12 Pro, you see the demand of, of space that's gonna be needed for different components. Um, here's a quick chart that shows that, you know, the, the battery is what really made the phone viable, right? A very, you know, very small space to give you a lot of uh, uh, ability to just provide energy to different components around it. And of course, this is, you know, we have to say this because Stan Winningham was one of the uh, winners of the Nobel Prize last year. Uh, he is, He's still supporting uh, Binghamton quite a bit as far as the research into the batteries. But if you look at what's happening is, you know, in order to make this thing work, the battery has to be able to, to provide a bat the, the, the power needed to support all these different functions. And, you know, you want a phone that would be able to last at least for 24 hours. You don't want to you should consider it. wrapping up. Okay. So, you know, HI really is the only way to support this kind of work is how do, you, how do you integrate all the functions? How do you put the memory? How do you put the, the application processors into a very small space? Each one of these units are less than a millimeter thick, right? So in order to do all this work, you had to integrate a lot of different components into one space to be live to, to, to work. This is just a quick chart of all the stuff that's even coming out uh, this year, like the, the LiDAR that's, that's in the iPhone, uh, depth sensor from the F Samsung, and then, you know, MEMS devices. Uh, and then here's a, the final chart, you know, the, the smartphone is going to be the, the driver for a lot of new technology into the, into the market. It is uh, probably the, the, it's going to demand the, 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 the most uh, advanced packaging to give you the smallest space, to give you the same function, uh, just the same thing that uh, Shafi mentioned yesterday about MEMS, you know, being half the size of what it is today because you just don't have the space anymore to, to, to do the work. So these are the cross strings that we that we do work work with, and then uh, again, you know, if anyone wants to to join our twig, uh, please let us know. Hey, thank you. So this is another vertical. Uh, I will describe to you uh, uh, what the interests of HIR for the aerospace and defense uh, industry. Uh, well, I want to thank my uh, previous co-chair, uh, Jeff Demon, who has stepped down, and uh, I welcome Dan Blast from Lockheed Martin to be the co-chair of this twig, and uh, we've got some, a um, lot of exciting activities that are going on, which I will describe. So the mission statement is to look at the specific and, and, and kind of niche needs that the aerospace and defense sector needs uh, for HI uh, technologies. So it, it, in some ways it echoes high performance computing, it echoes some of the more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, harsh environment like automotive, but we got our own, own needs. So, so it, it, it's gonna require us to take a look at the, uh, the use of integrated photonics, uh, ch single chip, multi-chip uh, um, uh, integration, security and supply chain. Those are the, right now some of the four things that I'll touch. 
So the backdrop is that uh, the uh, aerospace and defense is a mesh, it's kind of, it is a network, right? But it's on the ground, in the air, in space. Uh, we, uh, they want the same connectivity that we do for commercial applications, but in a way that uh, uh, it's very uh, reliable and high performance. So, uh, so right now, uh, the, the defense sector cannot uh, leverage, you know, the microelectronics industry very much because its percentage of revenue spent on that is not very big compared to commercial, and therefore, uh, the sector has to depend on commercial technologies and to leverage it as best as we can, uh, and then and, and take into account our requirements. So the changing landscape, uh, this is updated from last year in that, it, it, that there's a, a foundry concentration in Asia, you can see in this chart, uh, this is revenue, right? This is not, um, uh, it doesn't, this particular chart does not differentiate between producers, boundaries and users, but you can see a high concentration in Asia. And right now uh, the supply chain has become in, in the forefront because of COVID-19 and many OEMs are rethinking about the location of manufacturing and then, and then the, the, the breakdown of the supply chain. And that's, uh, and that's uh, so I think you can see the impact which I'll describe. So you can see again, uh, this chart kind of re-echoes what I just said, revenue side, even though it seems to be highly dominated by, by US companies, but in fact, if you look at capabilities, which is shown on the right-hand side, it's primarily focused in Asia. And, and that right now uh, is uh, uh, things that uh, is of concern to the aerospace and defense uh, uh, world. So this chart you may have seen before from last time, the supply chain is highly complex. Those uh, products in different parts of the life cycle goes back and forth. But, but as I mentioned, um, there seems to be now a uh, reopening of uh, having domestic capability. And even before government uh, sponsorship, both TSMC and Samsung are now planning state-of-the-art CMOS boundaries on domestic sites. So this is very interesting. And I think that this particular community is watching very carefully uh, if and when those capabilities come online, okay? So the unique uh, part of uh, aerospace and defense, uh, as I already mentioned, we want high performance, high reliability, but we have extremely long life uh, product life cycles uh, and, and not in like a cell phone that you throw away in two years, but we want our products like uh, aircraft to last 20, 30, maybe even 40 years. And, and the other thing is uh, we are in uh, need of a domestic supply chain. Um, so this is what this kind of shows you, different between a smartphone and, and, and then a, a complex aircraft, right? Very, very different uh, requirements uh, and, and, and system drivers. So these are some of the drivers, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, NRE cost and schedule reliability uh, are for harsh environment and then RF convergence and autonomy. All these are, are very complex system requirements. We're trying to deliver solutions in the microelectronics era. And, and, and of course, these are the, uh, some of the metrics we, we want to consider, performance, energy, interfaces, thermal, reliability, and so forth. So I wanted to go through and, and update uh, you on what some, some uh, recent government heritage integration programs are. So uh, for a long time through DARPA, which is the US government's uh, research branch, uh, they have funded a lot of programs which are now transitioning into uh, more mature programs, which I will describe. Um, so so this, this chart I just uh, borrowed from Gordon Keeler who, who showed it yesterday and I thought it was a great chart summarizing what the US government's interest in all three levels, right? Technology diversity, functional diversity, and then materials diversity. And they have a number of different programs listed on the right-hand side that are addressing and researching in these areas. So, so DARPA program typically uh, 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 at low TRL level to demonstrate the concept and to, to show that it's viable. It does not yet create a, what I call capability that you can use, okay? So this I won't go into, you saw this yesterday from, uh, uh, from Gordon, the, uh, you know, what, what DARPA chips was able to uh, uh, create and the big deal of DARPA chips was uh, through Intel. We now have an open standard called AIB, which can be used to uh, uh, specify uh, uh, data communication uh, across chiplets. As I mentioned, photonics is a really important because we see the, uh, the end of the line for copper and we need to go to photonics in order to get a terabit per second interconnect between different parts of our system. So what I, I would, the uh, last couple of minutes would describe uh, what some recent programs right now that is now going to help build capability, not for demonstration like DARPA, but to build capability. There are two programs I wanna point out. 
the rapid assured microelectronics prototype using advanced commercial capability or uh, called RAMP. And the other one, which is more dear maybe to this community is the state of the art heterogeneous integration program or also known as SHIP. Uh, SHIP right now is entering into phase two um, and there are two parts. Uh, there is uh, RF SHIP and there's digital SHIP just as there is an RF and digital portion of RAMP. Okay. I'm about a minute and a half left. Okay. So if you look at uh, uh, what this program envisioned by the Department of Defense is that RAMP would be covering from uh, concept to RTL to GDS2 and then SHIP would cover the packaging after the devices come out of the foundry. So these are kind of both sides of this uh, balance uh, that we're trying to uh, create a domestic capability. There's a concept now called quantifiable assurance model. The DOD is moving away from the trusted foundry model, but we need to create a, a new way of doing things. And other people are calling this the zero trust model. And, and that is being kind of copied from the IT world talking about cybersecurity, but we, we want to apply these kind of concepts for microelectronics development. So SHIP right now is, uh, is, is, uh, is right now underway. Uh, there are two awardees in SHIP right now that down selected from, uh, from phase one. Uh, digital SHIP is led by Intel and, and then uh, RF SHIP is led by Corvo. So, so both are now uh, in a process of bringing up capability facilities and then eventually offering services to uh, the aerospace and defense community. So digital, this, this goes a little bit deeper on what digital ship is looking at and, and this one on, on Corvo, right? Both are pretty early right now. So there's really not that much to describe but they're, they're doing facilities planning and build out and so forth. So what's really exciting right now is the Congress has taken notice, right? And, and, and just uh, approved at the end of last year uh, is the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, uh, and which was uh, uh, for fiscal year 2021, is that the US government is now seriously putting in a significant amount of resources and dollars into funding the creation of domestic foundry capability. So I think this is uh, uh, something that we watch. This is an authorization, it's not a funding yet. So we have to take a look at when the funding actually becomes available and then can be make use to uh, help uh, bolster the domestic supply chain for both CMOS and packaging. So, so in summary, uh, so we will continue to uh, look at these needs, address uh, what's happening uh, right now. It's moving quite rapidly. Well, to, in the defense world, uh, moving at this pace is over considered rapid, right? So, so right now we are continue to uh, work on these uh, uh, things and then uh, and then uh, look in the future and, and raise the challenges and look at potential solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I uh, invite John Hunt. John, you're up next. I'm the co-chair of the wafer level packaging twig. Uh, Rosalia Baker is the chair. Here's a list of the team members. And we're doing wafer level package, but included in that is panel level packaging because there's a lot of effort going on to be able to produce the same package, identical device, using an expanded panel packaging technology is equivalent to a wafer level package. So our twig will include both wafer and panel level packaging. And in the wafer level packaging, we're including both wafer level chip scale package, which is typically a fan in type product, meaning that there's no expanded area beyond the die itself and wafer level and panel level fan out packaging, which expands the available area for conductivity beyond the limits of the die. As I said, we will cover both wafer and panel. The main markets are similar. Initially, they were mobile and small devices, low density devices, but in the last several years, the fan out specifically has been uh, targeting a lot of the networking and the high density packaging areas. And now with some recent developments in 3D, some of the wafer level CSP type products can also cover the networking. Here I'm listing the drivers and enabling technologies. The enabling technologies are similar, although the fan out requires some additional technologies because it has additional processing steps, particularly molding and uh, the panel processing. Historically, wafer level chip scale packages were either two simple 2D devices, or the only way we could really get heterogeneous integration was to use TSVs and to be able to stack a second die on top of the first die. 
that was the limiting factors for ability of heterogeneous integration in traditional wafer level chip scale packages. But recently there's been some developments. TSMC has their SOIC, which is a system on integrated chips and that uses hybrid bonding to stack chips either die wafer on wafer or chip on wafer. And that allows more complex structures and heterogeneous integration within the confines of the chip itself. So it typically is a wafer level chip scale package. And in the same vein, Samsung has developed their X cube technology. It doesn't use currently hybrid bonding. The plan is to develop hybrid bonding for it, but currently uses TSVs through the die and micro bumps to connect between the die. And again, it also uses uh, die to create a heterogeneous package that is, is die size. Now, taking it one step further, wafer level packaging does take on a new meaning. TSMC recently is uh, promoted in the ECTC, their info system on wafer, in which they produce an entire system on a wafer. So the entire wafer is a system. So it's typically a wafer level package, literally. And then below that, you can see the Cerebris has their wafer scale engine. It's the largest rectangular single chip that you can fit on a 300 millimeter wafer. So it also is a wafer level package, literally. It literally is the size of the wafer. If we look at fan out heterogeneous examples, we can do chip last, chip first. We can do double sided POPs. We can use selective shielding technologies along with the fan out technologies. We can actually put in 10 end packages. And that can be done quite well because you can form patterns in the RDL with much tighter tolerances than you can on a substrate. Then we have various versions <clears throat> of hybrid fan out where we actually put the fan out die, multiple dies onto a, a substrate similar to a BGA. And that we can do chip first die down, chip first die up, chip last. And in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of interest in chip last fan out with bridge. So in this case, the bridge die isn't put into the substrate, but it's put into the fan out structure. And that allows you to get high density while using a low density RDL structure. So that's still in development with uh, multiple suppliers. And in the bottom, I just show an example of fan out SIP where you can take multi-source dye from different fabs. You can take different components like men's crystals, filters, and passives and combine them all into a fan out SIP. And panel processing has been the buzzword for the last couple of years. So there's increased interest in it. There's the potential for price reduction, which is what's driving a lot of the people for it. You can get higher material utilization efficiency also. There's at least three companies that'll be in some level of production for panel fan out by the end of this year. <clears throat> we have multiple approaches in different panel sizes. There's no standardization in the industry. Um, we're also evaluating the use of that same panel processing for structures other than traditional fan out. Um, it has been slow to ramp because you need volumes. You need high volumes. You can fit five times as many that packages on a panel as you can on a uh, 300 millimeter wafer. Yeah, and about two minutes left. The material in the process is different. Have required multiple process flow changes and modifications and developments. Here is just an example of uh, Tanya gave a talk on Fraunhofer's IGN panel fan out. And on the right is the 600 millimeter example that ASE and NEPIs are both working on for uh, DECA technology. So what's happened is we've been able to use technologies developed for a whole wide variety of packaging and combine them and utilize them, reuse them for fan out technologies particularly. So it allows us to do wafer level packaging heterogeneous integration. You can see on the left, it's not all inclusive, but just some of the technologies that are being utilized. And finally, some of the key challenges for fan in and fan out, some of them are similar. There's a few additional ones for fan out for the complexity. There's a list of future work and contributing wafer level packaging twig members. 
So I won't go into the detail. I'll let you read it at your leisure. And I think I actually finished early. Uh, Bill Bottoms, if you're up, you're on. So we're heterogeneous. You see heterogeneous integration by materials. Is that what you see? Yes. Yes. Okay. And and uh, it, it goes for conductors where we have nanomaterials and metals and composites for dielectrics, yep. oxide polymers, porous materials and composites and semiconductors, not just elemental. There are three fives and two sixes and tertiary compounds and, and polymers as well. So the materials parameters for all of these materials have to be compatible with each other for processing and operation because they, they have to be compatible to processing temperatures. And that means that uh, you've got to worry about uh, compatible from cost point of view, CTE differential, thermal conductivity, fracture toughness, modulus, processing temperature, interfacial adhesion, operating temperature, and breakdown field strength. So it's not a simple thing to do to make sure that all of those materials fit. They have to be customized. So what are the materials challenges? Most of the, excuse me, my, my machine just shut down for me. Give me just a second. Okay, most of the new materials that will be in production in the next decade are for improvements in CMOS and to support 3D integration. The materials align for all post-fab processes at use case temperature. Uh, that's certainly important important because you don't want the properties to change by inserting a lot of stress by operating at a different temperature from which you put them together. We have to have lower, lower K dielectrics and higher, uh, with higher resistance to mechanical stress. We have to have low and high K dielectrics, both with high breakdown field strength. We have to have conductors and increased electrical and thermal conductivity better than we have today. And low cost conductors and dielectrics with a CTE very close to silicon in order to manage the warpage problem. Uh, finally, low, low cost insulating materials with high thermal conductivity for obvious reasons, thermal management. And there's one more, I think. And that's materials for quantum computing at higher temperature. I don't mean higher temperature than we were talking about things above. Right now, we're still doing quantum computing at near absolute zero. And, if we could get to liquid nitrogen temperature, it would be more practical and we'd be able to use it at low cost. Even taking it up 20, 30 degrees would make a lot of difference. Next slide. So we've got warp rates for every thinner layers and there are solutions for warp rates that depend on integrating new materials into low cost production. And they are the following, reduced copper CTE to 4.5 from 17. That's already been done. It's a nanotube composite. And in fact, it has uh, better conductivity than copper itself. Low modulus dielectrics without compromising other properties. We're not there yet. Uh, we don't need to use underfill. We can use direct interconnect bonding if we have our CTEs matched and perform all the joining processes at or near the use case temperature because with thin layers, once again, we'll get warpage stresses that will change the characteristics of what we're seeing. Heterogeneous integration of materials and processes resolve a, uh, resolve a system problem. Key elements for thermal management, don't make heat in the first place. Lower resistance conductors, lower operating voltage, lower K dielectrics, active voltage control, rapid shutdown, sub nanosecond, which you can do with gallium nitride and increased heat sink, uh, improved heat sink materials and design. But the three most important ones, if you click it again, are lowering resistance, lowering dielectric constant, and improved heat sinks. Next slide, please. Here are examples of proof of concept using cobalt. Line resistance went down by 60% uh, and contact resistance by 1.5 reduction. And uh, in the uh, new, new device types, we have a shape-shifting material where we can use a 2D Molly Telluride and by applying voltage, cause some of those uh, structures to rise higher above this above a plane, and so it's very low energy and uh, very high density, but still uh, developmental. Next slide. Examples of materials requirements: 
We need new materials for replacing the CMOS switch. Maybe 2D materials like carbon nanotube and, laminar, and graphene and similars made of other atoms. Nanowires for interconnect and, and device switch structures, which people are already uh, using experimentally. Conductors that can be used for atomic level mechanical switches. Uh, there are some available and, and those have actually been built. Optical switch material that's supporting all optical logic. There, there is some, there's a lot of work going on there. Some of that has already produced results, but it's not readily available. We need a biomaterial for brain energy level switch and, and also for interconnect density. Um, next. And the other things we need are what we can't imagine yet. And when we're looking out for the emerging research materials area 25 years, there's a lot we can't imagine yet. Next slide. The 25 year horizon includes more developmental properties. You don't need to go back. 2D class of materials can support many types of devices and uh, those will be more important as we go forward. You can get a semi-metal with graphene. You can get a semiconductor uh, with <clears throat> TMDs. Uh, you can get topological insulator, which has great properties, and you probably don't know what they are. You can make an insulator. Uh, you can make a superconductor with niobium selenide, and just a, metal a metallic characteristics with 2D conductors. So the 2D materials can be configured to make whatever you want, from a semiconductor to an insulator and everything in between. Still about next a minute slide. and a half. Yeah, next slide. Some will be major contributors during the next 10 years, but other applications will also be important for the emerging research and materials in the 2030, 2045. Next slide. Here's an example. Electron injection can change the lattice structure of 2D molytelluride, and this shows the uh, development of phase-related electrical conductor shapes. Next slide. This is the final slide. The seven Material subchapter identifies difficult challenges and potential solutions and identifies probable date for volume production in our tables when, when it's possible. The emerging research area is much more difficult to quantify since it's got a 25 year horizon and depends on things that, that have yet to be developed. Uh, so the timing's not so specific there. And finally, our objective is to accelerate the pace of progress by stimulating pre-competitive collaboration through the materials that is in the roadmap. Last presenter for this session is Robert. Robert Lowe. So uh, this is a chapter, IoT chapters. Uh, my name is Wei Song Lo uh, from EG Taiwan. Thanks for Bill Chance uh, from ASE and the Rock Well Suits, Cisco's uh, contributions. So uh, the exact summary of 2020's IoT actually, uh, we have uh, uh, actually uh, due to the global pandemic, there has been a major change for all of us. So uh, what we believe is uh, more and more IoT usages in our daily life. So here, here in our uh, revised versions, so we put uh, we update some uh, uh, technologies what we observe here. And we also, uh, uh, in addition, also uh, add on some uh, IoT platform cases. So it's actually it's difficult for all of us to find out the IoT platform cases. Uh, anyway, we try to find some cases. So if uh, uh, any one of you can uh, input more uh, uh, better data, data for all of us for the IoT platform, that would be very welcome. So uh, according to the uh, uh, Cisco's uh, by the 2030 for the IoT still there's an exponential uh, growth. So, so 500 million devices uh, will be connected. And all those that uh, uh, smart and connected devices can generate, uh, can generate the data. I think the data will be the most important part for the AI applications. So uh, actually if we can have a uh, uh, those data, so we can 
uh, we can uh, make up uh, uh, in in time uh, and we can make up in time actions and make up uh, right decisions. So all our paragraph actually include the funded benefit of IoT challenges for IoT all the way down to the example uh, heterogeneous uh, integration solutions. I think this is the most important part for all of us. So we try to find some uh, example. So uh, hopefully uh, uh, we we have uh, some uh, uh, we have uh, some uh, example later on. We will share with you an IoT e uh, ecosystem and the heterogeneous integration inference in the uh, heterogeneous integration development is also another very important part. And finally, it is the future of IoT. So example of heterogeneous integrations, uh, this year actually uh, we refer, uh, we like to refer to other uh, three chapters from the 2D, 3D, uh, SIP, UFO level package, 5G, and all the way also include the material as well. But the, how we doesn't put the material on that, but we should add it down. But uh, so from the different category, uh, connectivity, uh, HAI, AIT for wearable. This year, actually, we are on the thin thin battery for IoT uh, microsystems and the uh, uh, sensor platform for IoT medical applications. So, take two, those two for example, the thin thin battery for IoT microsystems. As you can see here, there's a demand for micro battery size energy solutions. That's what we choose. And the, after the injection mode soldering, actually they make it very small, uh, 22.5 uh, millimeters square. And uh, by the thickness, it's very thin. It's 100 micron, it's 0.1 millimeters. And then the other one, what we'd like to share with you is the sensor platform for the IoT medical applications. Since uh, uh, COVID-19 could be an pandemic, is a, is a uh, best important part for all of us. Um, uh, I think, uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, what we demonstrate is that disposable cartridge contained of a CMOS chip and the reader connect to the smartphone. And for those one, for this one, actually the system have the uh, ability to quantify uh, the uh, different uh, material, uh, cholesterol and the urate within the human uh, physiological range. And the, for the platform, uh, what you select here is for two. There's a, the first one is a IoT platform. How we adopt this one from the MediaTek. And the thanks for MediaTek that provide those kind of a platform. And uh, as you can see here, they have high speed AI edge computing capability. And they also the, there's a uh, AI recognition capability. So uh, for the smart home, they, they have the face identifications. As you can see that uh, for the payment for a main store or face access for this smart building or company attendance systems, this is a good platform for that. And then for the other ones, uh, as, uh, and then for, uh, for this platform, actually for the IoT platforms, uh, what we believe they can reduce the uh, factor size, and they reduce the power consumption, they improve the performance. So what we believe uh, for this uh, kind of platform, they can face some uh, further improved by the heterogeneous integration to be uh, much smaller. We have about two one, minutes left. Okay, for the other ones, actually the IOT, uh, AIoT platform two, uh, we select is for the vital signal and the healthcare monitoring. So no matter how there's a hospital or at home, uh, that's expanded to to do some uh, monitoring for patient or by the or including the remote healthcare program to allow the patient to input or upload the data too. So it's, uh, for the last two or three slides, actually uh, there's uh, some suggestions for the heterogeneous integration cross trait. Actually, uh, personally, I think the uh, there's a uh, first level common heterogeneous technology roadmap is needed for all of us. Uh, for example, there's a, on the left hand side, there's a, some uh, 
some figure uh, getting from the uh, TSM3, the other is from the uh, DARPA programs. Probably we need ev everyone, we need one. And then for the 2021 IoT chapters, uh, the Puzzle Green Plan, what we like to ask for the help is a specific application required input and indigenous integration solutions. So a real IoT solution deployed with either wild or battery based uh, power supply or unique requirement for IoT applications, and especially with connected to the heterogeneous integrations or the, uh, or the uh, uh, collections, more medical devices is very important for all of us. So more discussions should be uh, worked with the other uh, chapters. That means the cross tweet. So uh, thank you for the contributors and uh, thank you for your attention. So we'd like to attract more uh, members and they can send the email to uh, Bill, uh, both Bill or either me. Okay. So folks, the reason for getting a lot of these excellent presenters to rush through this is so that we could have time to talk among ourselves. The floor is open. We have two or three questions which we will use to start things and then open the... Uh, Chris Bailey had a question for Tim. The question was aerospace defense are very small volumes and obsolescence, obsolescence and security are a high priority. How do, how do you see future COTS-based heterogeneous packages impacting this? Uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, question. It's uh, definitely on um, top of our list to address uh, those issues of, uh, as I already mentioned, small volume, low volume is a big problem. Um, and uh, we, we are not in, in the same category as high volume users, uh, irregardless of whether the OSAT uh, is onshore or offshore. Uh, in terms of security, there are very interesting concepts that can be uh, used in that, that, in that area, right? So, so right now um, uh, we are uh, concerned about uh, IP protection. And so that's, that, that part is, you know, you can imagine what we can take a look at, including if, for example, we have programmable logic, then, then programmable logic, the, uh, that means that uh, your algorithms and how, how you do things are loaded at runtime. And so therefore in the, uh, OSAP stage, then the, the, the chip is pretty much a blank slate. So, so that's one way of, of addressing that issue. We have two questions, three questions for Bill Bottoms. Uh, Bill, first question is, are you considering low CTE PCBs? Uh, Carl says, we used to, we use these to eliminate solder joint failures at GE. Okay, we are considering low, low CTE materials and, and we're making some low CTE materials by composites. One good example is if you put a little carbon nanotubes into copper, you can drop its CTE right down to the level of silicon. Uh, and you can drop it farther if you increase further the, uh, this carbon nanotube percentage in the matrix. Okay, the next question, Bill, also for you is what advanced thermal materials are you considering? Well, um, <clears throat> one of them is, is the composite copper. It has better thermal conductivity just as it has better electrical conductivity for the same reason. It's a mixture of the properties of carbon nanotubes and, and copper. Uh, the other is that diamond is getting to be a cheaper thing to make in, in thin films and maybe a combination of, of diamond on one side of a, of a thermal joint uh, and the carbon nanotube composite on the other side, we get something that's better than anything we have today. I don't think anyone's measured that yet, but it's worth looking into. Bill, third question also for you. What about emerging materials to support high voltage operations? Uh, emerging materials to support high voltage operations actually was mentioned in that we need higher uh, breakdown strength in our, in our dielectrics. And that's the biggest place where it where it comes to bear. Um, <clears throat> there, are, there are some materials available with much higher breakdown strength. Uh, the low K dielectrics are the weak spot. Uh, they they don't, aren't very good mechanically and they're not very good for, for breakdown spring, strength. So there's work to be done. I'd like to open this up to the audience. One of the one of the feedbacks we had yesterday was that we needed greater audience participation. So I'd like to encourage the audience to either 
unmute and ask questions directly or put questions in the chat either would be if I, welcome if I, could, if I could just make one comment before we do that uh -huh. what the materials group has to do is to serve all the other twigs because they need different materials properties we have to know what they are and try to get as close to them as possible and so in, i wanted to get that out in the discussion our our objective is to serve all the other twigs with the materials properties they need and they have to come to us and tell us what they are Bill, one more question popped up. It is, what is your view of the future of passives? They're not going away. <laughs> we, 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 we will find, uh, we need lower K dielectrics. We need higher K dielectrics. Uh, those are two of the most important uh, pieces and they're both needed. The problem with the low K dielectrics is the very low ones is they're not very strong mechanically and they're fragile. And <clears throat> The, we're getting better with high K, but there's still some room to go. I see. Is uh, John Oakley still online? Jo John, there was a question to you for uh, for you about microchannel cooling and whether you thought microchannel cooling was not a feasible solution. I believe it is in reference to a comment you had made in your slides. No, no, uh, I, I would say we have a, uh, a lot of novel and exotic approaches out here. Uh -huh. And then we talked yesterday about uh, some of the work that the Chirp Center is doing with Just Reliable, uh, where they're actually doing like scale vapor chambers. Uh, so this is a, uh, a work that may be scalable. A lot of the ones we have today are, they're not really uh, cost effective maybe to have an end product in general, but I think we are making improvements. It's, it's, it's hard to deploy it in kind of low cost uh, or in general for lots of devices, right? There's one more question uh, in the meanwhile for Bill. It says, appreciate your mention that your twig is working on providing material properties to other twigs. Hopefully you're also considering robustness under life cycle stress conditions. This will be important for system reliability. Yeah, we certainly are considering the stress conditions issue and that, that's the only specific parameter of robustness that I, that I think we have to worry about. I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any other that are really a problem. I have a question for Tim. Tim, you've walked through Tim Lee. That you've seen the 5G evolution and you pointed out that it was not as good as you would have liked it to be. What would you do differently for 6G? Uh, so 6G is a new frontier. Uh, I think it's going to kind of call for um, new semiconductor devices because uh, when you operate above 100 gigahertz to Five six hundred gigahertz beyond, uh, you have to have gain in the device. So I think we need a new generation of devices, whether that's so silicon based or silicon modified with uh, 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 other dopants or going to indium phosphide. That's yet to be determined. Um, but the the good news is that there are a lot of uh, bandwidth available at the in the uh, uh, in the two hundred four hundred gigahertz range. So we we can solve the problems. I think uh, we need to, that's why I think it'd be good for this uh, IEEE community to really uh, inform the academic community and other people that are interested. What, these are the challenges. When you think 5G is difficult. These are the challenges that right now there are no good solution. There's not even good uh, channel model of propagation in these bands. So, 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 so we need to make antennas that work in these bands, integrated our front ends that, uh, and also to look at use cases that uh, is it going to be just 10 meters away to, to maybe 10 meters? Uh, or, or can we think of a, a backhaul, right? So one potential application for 6G in a terabit uh, thing is a, a replacement of a fiber backhaul. So, so I think there's many different challenges yet to be de de uh, defined. Um, this is Bill Chen. I have follow-up question for, for, for Tim Lee. Um, right now for millimeter wave, the additional AIP that is installed is substantially increasing the cost. Do you see that if we have go to 6G and antennas on the chip, that the cost would come down? I think, I think that the trade needs to be made, but uh, I think uh, the general feeling is that above uh, 60 gigahertz, maybe uh, above 90 gigahertz, that's where the switch over from AIP to uh, 
the antenna on the chip would really make sense because again, for integration purposes, uh, the uh, element, element spacing, we probably would not have room for uh, attaching a separate antenna. Um, but that's uh, and now, now you're talking about maybe wafer level integration uh, as being the scheme to, uh, to advance uh, 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 products uh, or uh, uh, in, in those frequency bands. Um, so we get back to maybe a monolithic solution. There are many different schemes right now that the major foundries are looking at for doing wafer to wafer bonding and then to have heterogeneous integration by having stack layers, but the layers, some could be RF material uh, 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 like uh, gallium nitride, some could be CMOS or SIGI. And, and then of course the top layer could be a passive for antennas. I have a question for John Hunt. John, the I mean, if you take the economics of the panel level transition out and just look at technology challenges, what do you think is limiting us? Or is there something that would limit the transition if somebody put enough money in this business? Well, <clears throat> pardon me, I haven't been talking much today. Um, what we're seeing is we put in uh, panel capability is getting the uniformity across the panel for all of the processes from the plasma processes, the sputtering, the plating. Uh, and the, probably the biggest difference between the smaller and the larger is the die shift after molding. So unless you have some form of adaptive uh, alignment that can compensate for that, it's very challenging especially with the larger die as we're getting into the network systems. And it's, you can do some compensation by pre-adjusting the position of the die. You put it backwards the way it would shift, but you can't compensate for rotation that way. And as the die get larger, the rotation on the outer perimeter pads becomes very significant. Warpage hasn't been as much of a problem. Our panels actually are not warping that bad, but the die shift is considerable. And probably the biggest problem is getting, since there's no standardization of equipment and the equipment hasn't been in the industry like the wafers, it's challenging to get the suppliers to develop the capability to maximize the utilization of the panel, to be able to get uniformity all the way to the edges. That's, that's the biggest, probably the biggest challenge. And is there work happening there to either drive standardization or to build in new metrologies or figure out what changes? Uh, has, I haven't seen any standardization. Every, everybody, it's like the wild, wild west. Everybody's going their own way. Uh, there are some that are using similar. Uh, we're using a 600 millimeter at ASC. Nepis is using a 600 millimeter. Some others are using around that, but others are using smaller. So. We also have a 300 millimeter square that was just to develop the feasibility of a panel processing, like slit die coating and things like that. But, but I haven't seen any standardization uh, taking place. So, nice. Subu has a question. Yeah, actually more of a comment if I may, may uh, Ravi. So yeah. regarding this uh, business of adaptive patterning, I mean, you uh, actually make a good point, John, that, you know, you can only manage this through pre-shifting to a limited extent. However, I think, you know, there are, there's work going on, for example, in our lab here on what is called um, adaptive patterning with AI, where we actually integrate the, uh, the pad placement, okay, uh, GDS file with a maskless uh, laser writer. And so what happens now actually is that you, the instructions are, you know, connect pad A to pad of chiplet A or dialet A to pad B of dialet B. And using uh, advanced AI techniques, you can actually recognize these pads, okay? Because you have an idea from the GDS and then the laser writer actually ensures that that connection is made as long as that shift in position is not humongous, right? I mean, by humongous, I mean less than sort of 10 microns or so in, uh, because the laser writer resolution may be only about two, uh, one micron to two microns. Okay, can I respond to that? Yeah, yeah, please. 
Okay. When I said compensation by adjusting the die, that's that's what's used typically for like the EWLB process. Mm -hmm. But we in NEPIs have licensed the DECA process and the DECA mm -hmm. does basically what you're saying. We uh, inspect every wafer after the molding, note the position of every die and the rotation of the die, and then on the fly within 30 seconds generate a new file it's for every wafer compensates every die individually. And within another 30 seconds, it gets transferred to a raster for the LDI. And the LDI writes a pattern, it's maskless, writes a pattern specific for that individual wafer to compensate every die. Now, the one problem with what you're describing is what DEC is initial. They had two different techniques, one called adaptive routing and the other adaptive alignment. Yours is more like their adaptive routing. And the problem with that is no two die or packages may have exactly the same routing because you've got to compensate. And that's good for low frequency, but as you get into RF, it becomes problematic for the customers. Uh, no, no, it, uh, there's no assumption that the two, two uh, specimens are identical. Absolutely but if, not. If you're changing the routing length, say the RDL pattern has to shift, Correct, Aren't but you, you, you potentially you, changing that RDL pattern. Yes, within constraints. Right. Okay. So, so another very important thing here, John, is that you need to actually place these dies close to each other. Okay, and close is like within, say, a few hundred microns. Okay, and that actually makes these things a lot easier to implement. You're talking about inter-die connectivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about even beyond that, just each, just connecting to the pads of individual die after molding is challenging. Forget interconnectivity between die. If the die shift or rotate and your next image for the RDL first layer, those vias may miss the pad. Okay, uh, uh, that is actually then a specific problem with your RDL first approach. But if you do the RDL last, okay, that that problem does not arise. We we recognize that, but RDL last is a more expensive process than RDL first. So where possible, we try and use an RDL first process, unless either like HBMs are expensive, die, or you need passives in it, then we use chip last. But if you go in the cost. The chip first die down is the lowest cost. Chip first die up is the next more costly. Uh, fan out bridge is the next most costly. And then chip last is the highest cost. So your utilization of the technology depends on the application and the customer's needs. Uh, absolutely. I mean, as always, right? Let me uh, ask another question to Benson. The, Benson, in your mind, the, you know, we haven't heard much about thermals limiting mobile transitions. Is that true or is this a problem that you think is something we need to look at and still? Uh... So, so thermal, thermal definitely is, is a concern. I mean, you look at all the devices that's, that's going in, uh, you've got to remove the heat. Um, one of the things that, that most of the manufacturers now are using uh, graphene sheets in back of the, uh, the display. So that's one of the things they've been doing. They've been adding that to uh, the, the back case as well to try to spread the heat around. Um, heat pipes were used qu quite a bit, but they, they don't seem to be as prevalent now just because heat pipes takes a lot, takes a lot of space. So I think no, no, no matter what it is gonna be is, uh, <clears throat> they're gonna try to use either the back case for spreading the heat or the, the display the display the heat. So the, does graphene have legs? Will it carry us through for the next few years or do you believe so, uh, more has to be done? I'm sure there's gonna be others. I think there was um, there was a development out of uh, University of Colorado. Uh, I forgot the, the, the professor's name, but he was, he was working on a thin vapor chamber uh, basically the same function as a, as a graphene sheet where you can mount it to either the, the case or the display, but it's a way of, of uh, moving the heat uh, faster 
you know, from the hotspots. So try to spread. Gonna be YC lead, maybe. Yes, yeah, YC, YC was. Yeah. YC, yeah. He he'd show me this. He showed it to me when we when I when I saw I think it was two years ago, and I believe it's in some of the products now. Is is all of the graphene that you're using a single layer graphene, uh, or are you using multiple layers and and rotating them? It's expanded graphene, so it's actually a compressible layer. Yeah. Okay. This is, um, this, Carl, this is Carl, I've got a couple of comments on thermal materials. Go ahead, Carl. In addition to carbon nanotube reinforced copper, uh, diamond particle reinforced silver and diamond particle reinforced copper are being used in advanced thermal materials, along with several types of gra graphitic materials which have thermal conductivities up to four times that of copper. And in going back to the idea of a of constraining the coefficient of expansion of printed circuit boards, which you, I think also uh, applies to uh, organic uh, interposers. You can control the CTE of a fiberglass material by adding layers of carbon fibers, which are, are very inexpensive, certainly compared to carbon nanotube copper. And we did that, that same approach using a copper invar copper laminate um, which which allows you to tailor the cte of the printed circuit board and in addition uh, we also uh, at general electric work with kevlar fiber reinforced epoxy printed circuit boards because a kevlar fiber gives you a very low cte and there are commercial um, materials now commercial um, kevlar 49 materials which are being used in low CTE printed circuit boards. And a lot of, a lot of the presenters have mentioned a problem with warping. And so those approaches give you a way to overcome the warping problem. Bill Chen, did you have a comment? Um, I was gonna comment on the, on the uh, mobile and um, I think when the, when Benson showed the slides of the uh, number of people adopting the smartphone, and you could see that it's limited to about seventy five percent of the global population. The 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 rest of the twenty five percent of the population in place in many places such as in Africa they cannot afford a smartphone. So the question for us, maybe in the long term, is to look at how can we reduce the cost of the phone? There was an article in New York Times two years ago that said that smartphones is very important for business people like farmers who cannot, for small business people like farmers and their limit of the smartphone is $25. So how do we reduce the cost of the smartphone with all the capabilities connecting to 4G and 5G and to be less than $25? Big challenge. Yep. There's also a comment here for Carl. Uh, Carl, the question is, what effect does in-plane CTE tailoring have on out-of-plane CTE needed for VR reliability? Is there an effect and what is the impact? If you start it, yes. Uh, if you're starting with a fiberglass board and you're constraining it in the XY plane, it will produce some through thickness expansion effect. So you have to quantify it. It may or may not be a problem. Okay, uh, I also have a question for Bill Chen since Bill last week talked to the National Science Foundation. Bill, do you want to summarize your impression of how we can engage the science piece of a lot of this for packaging? I think there is a misconception in our community that packaging do not involve science. And that is an important question for us because we are responsible for doing this 
So if packaging do not involve science, then uh, we are just uh, um, play around in the sand without any knowledge. So we need to change the perception of the community. And especially if we want to see more long-term science going on in research, looking into the future. I think we need to be responsible for putting the word out, identifying the important science areas and, uh, and bring that to the, um, um, how should I call it? The people who fund uh, research. Ah. And that's a very important part and I see that it's important for us to make that change all across the whole ecosystem. Okay, uh, I'm also very happy to see Professor Paul Ho online uh, and Paul has worked, uh, has had a very successful career in this. Paul, did you have an opinion on this particular topic? Yeah, uh, I'm happy to join uh, finally uh, after so many times. Well, anyway, I agree with uh, Bill, I think that, that this is if one area now, the um, university, okay, is uh, really looking for some, for some guidance from the uh, industry, how to uh, work through the industry with the uh, government agencies, okay? I think that's uh, really the problem. I think that in here, I think that Bill has a very good point. I think that, that, that after all, I mean that the university really have to uh, join in to share some of the uh, basic research. But then the uh, university now is uh, facing the problem is that if uh, government agencies sell them, it's uh, often uh, reluctant to support it because they say, well, it's uh, important then the industry should support it. But um, I, I think that, that the, uh, it would be good to uh, have uh, some, some 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 joint effort or at least uh, get the message through okay um, thank you um, ravi if i might add yes uh, with uh, next flex we were invited actually by nsf yeah. to hold an nsf workshop with next flex and all the companies and the academics mm -hmm. uh, they gave us about fifty thousand dollars and it was a very successful event that helped to try to seed the pipeline of what NSF should be including in its calls. So that might be something we could try. No, I think for HI Bark, you're absolutely right. This is something we ought to consider. Uh, in some respects, I can't wait for the pandemic to be over so we can do this in a very pragmatic sense. Uh, but you're right, that is the right way to do it. Hey, hey, Ravi, uh, Dureji. Yes, yes uh, Paul, uh, great hearing from you. In fact, uh, 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 recently we were doing some work with Envi, as you probably know. And it's an extension of some of the work that uh, you, your former students have been doing. So uh, currently uh, some of my students are working in there with uh, uh, Dwayne. Uh, so yes, I think that, uh, that uh, individual companies are putting some efforts at uh, universities related to packaging, uh, uh, whether it's material characterization or thermal or, or uh, uh, general reliability, but not uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, the governments, uh, like uh, Bill Chen said, seem to think that uh, uh, packaging is sort of an afterthought. And of course, that's not what heterogeneous integration is all about, right? That packaging is a big leverage, not to replace Moore's law, but to complement it rapidly, like you said, right? So, yeah. so I think we need to talk about that. So I, I well said, Bill Chen, related to uh, uh, packaging and science. I think, I think it is important for us to, to think how do we phrase the issues that we see today in terms of issues in relating understanding of science. I think we have at least 50% of the responsibility um, and we should not, should not just say, oh, it is the academia that need to understand us. We need to understand academia. We need to understand science. Yeah, I think John had a very good summary of the plans, you know, the strategic direction. We'll have to do a little translation. Uh, we are out of time, but let me see if I can slide one more question. And Benson had a question for Tim. Tim, you had a chart on additive manufacturing. What features would be 
made using additive manufacturing to support 5G? Uh, thank you for that question, Benson. Uh, I think the features, I think, uh, so normally with other lithography, we can get very fine pitch and line width control. So in the additive, I think uh, it's, uh, it's usually worse than that, but it has the advantage of a very uh, low cost and you can print on maybe flexible substrates. So there's a lot of things that we can take a look at. It may not fit for the handset uh, uh, use case or, or whatever, but there are gonna be other cases where radios make sense to be on curved surfaces or to have really low cost deployment. And then we can we use uh, a 3D printing or inkjet technology in order to um, solve some of those problems. I think it's uh, an area that I, I know that some people in the microwave community are looking at, but uh, requires a bit more research on uh, this twins group in order to really ask these type of questions and, and, and look at its potential. Thank you.